Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories. We have stories that should thrill you a little and chill you a little. It's amazing. What you'll hear are adventures sent in by you guys, classic stories from the pulp mags, and episodes from the golden age of radio. We have special segments like Ghost Stories with Sylvia. That's amazing. And these are your stories. So settle in for the next hour and enjoy the show. One more thing. You just might want to prepare yourself to be taken away from today. have a bit of a different show for you today. One story to rule them all. I like doing this from time to time. It gives me a break, more time to come up with new stuff, and it gives you a full hour story to enjoy. Some of the feedback I get says that it takes too long to get to the main story. Well, for me, that's kind of the point. After all, it is Ron's Amazing Stories, not Story. Full-hour OTRs are actually rare, and it can be really hard to find a good one. Today, I'm pretty sure I've found you a good one. So, let's get to it, and please, enjoy the show. Our featured story is an episode of the Screen Director's Playhouse. I'm slowly working my way through these shows, and I've come to the conclusion that these dramas represent the best of old-time radio. It truly was the theater of the mind. They had to do with sound what video does with sight. Truly amazing. The episode we're going to play deals with a very dark time in history. It was after World War II and the trials that took place at Nuremberg. Not all of the war criminals were tried during that time. A few escaped and had to be tracked down. One of these was Klaus Barbie. He was the head of the Gestapo in occupied French Lyon. He was also known as the Butcher of Lyon. Our story takes a look at this real character and the events that led to his arrest. However, it is fictional, and the location, names, and actual events were changed quite a bit. Why they did that is lost to time. I'm guessing maybe it was all too fresh a wound. The story is titled Rogue's Regiment and was part of the final season of the Screen Director's Playhouse. It stars one of my very favorite actors, Dick Powell, and has a real 50s film noir feel to it. It first aired on May 17, 1951. Now, I'm pretty sure that you're going to enjoy this one. Screen Director's Playhouse stars Dick Powell, Peggy Dow, and Alex Nico. Production, Rogue's Regiment. Director, Robert Florey. Tonight, the Screen Director's Playhouse is pleased to present transcribed for the first time on the air, an exciting story of adventure and intrigue. Our adaptation is the screenplay, Rogue's Regiment, and our stars, Dick Powell and Peggy Dow, with Alex Nico. Before we begin the first act of tonight's Screen Director's Playhouse production, here is Dick Powell. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight's presentation, Rogue's Regiment, deals with the apprehension of one of the world's most despicable killers. Not a fictional character, but one of true life. The Nazi, whom we shall call Martin Bruner, the Butcher of Dachau. 
We leave to your imagination who this character really is. Now, the first act of the Screen Director's Playhouse presentation of Rogue's Regiment, starring Dick Powell in his original role of Major Corbett, Peggy Dow as Lily, with Alex Nicole as Van Ratten. Five, January 1949, to Commanding General... Army of Occupation, from Major Whitfield Corbett, United States Military Intelligence, Headquarters, Frankfurt, Germany. To make this report comprehensible, it is essential to refer to the circumstances which caused the following investigation to be made. Inside the ruins of a small garden. Two men wearing the uniforms of the SS Elite Guard, now identified as Colonel Martin Bruner and Lieutenant Heindorf, stood staring down at the ground where two human figures lay side by side, wrapped completely in gasoline soaked army blankets. Then a lighted match was thrown into the pile. Instantly, a tremendous sheet of flame burst up from the funeral pile. And so it was on April 30th, 1945, that man's greatest insanity upon this earth, Adolf Hitler, was destroyed, together with the woman, Eva Braun. A few months later, the trials began at Nuremberg. One by one, the Nazi war leaders faced the cold, factual testimony of their crimes and heard their sentences read. Hermann Goering, to be hanged. Joachim von Ribbentrop, to be hanged. Rudolf Hess, life in prison. Julius Stryker, to be hanged. Alfred Jodl, to be hanged. Carl Dennitz, to be hanged. Alfred Rosenberg, to be hanged. Ernst Kaltenbrunner, to be hanged. Three years later, only one important name remained unchecked on that infamous list. The only top-ranking Nazi still alive who had not been found, Martin Bruner. Have a seat, Major. Thank you, sir. Ever see a picture of Martin Bruner? No, sir. My information is that the German high command issued strict orders in 1935 that he was never to be photographed, and for excellent reasons. Next to Hitler and Himmler, he was the most powerful man in Germany. Correct. Here's a picture of him in a group shot with other officers of the SS Elite Guard. Unfortunately, it only shows the back of his head. Pretty rough, isn't it, Major? Well, it's not a party. We have only two vague pieces of evidence to work with. A cigarette case, which was identified as a gift to Martin Bruner, picked up in Athens. And a pair of cufflinks found in Karachi, India last October. That's about it. Not quite. This star sapphire... Bruner's was found by a French agent at Herban, North China, last week. North China? Indochina? Yes. Hmm. Well, if we knew who disposed of all these things, then at least a pattern of his movements would take form. Yes. Somewhere in Asia, for whatever good that does us, he's Martin Bruner. Perhaps. If only we knew where and what he looks like. Major, prepare to leave for North China. Good luck. Twin lines of steel gleamed dully in the darkness as the Natsung Saigon Express roared through a jungle of swampland. Inside the train, the compartments were loaded with ex-Nazis who had become soldiers of fortune and had joined the French Foreign Legion. In my compartment were Mark Van Rotten, a handsome and prepossessing man of about 45, Colonel Le Mercier of the French Foreign Legion, and a very quiet and ordinary-looking German who hadn't uttered a word since I came into the compartment. 
are at war here, yes, Maratin. The Vietnamese wish to throw us out and to establish an independent nation. So they say, and so they honestly believe possible. But who gave them the idea? Who supplies them with guns and ammunition? Who gives the order to their leader, Tron de Guillaume? You have been reading your own propaganda, my dear Colonel. Ah. Oh. The people of Indochina are fighting only because they are tired of French injustice and misrule. Nonsense, nonsense. If the Vietnamese were not agitated by their false friends, we could soon settle our little differences. Believe me, Van Rattin, I know these natives better than you. You are an art dealer, a businessman, but colonization is also an art. Yes, an art that teaches the colonized how to get rid of the colonizer. Jamais, jamais, we are here to stay. How long can you afford to stay? With over 600 of your legionnaires killed or wounded each month, is it really worth the price, Colonel? What is a man's life worth? Three times now the Vietnamese have tried to assassinate me because I am a symbol of the French they hate. No, Van Rattin. There are but two marching songs in the world today. The Internationale, which may be theirs, and La Marseillaise, which will always be ours. Ah. Now, pardonnez-moi, gentlemen, I leave the compartment. I will return in a moment. You, sir. Me? Yes, I agree with you. There's no one quite as stupid as the professional soldier. No, I don't remember saying it, but you could be right. You came aboard the train at Nha Trang, as I recall. That's right. You must have eyes in the back of your head. Rather interesting town, don't you think? No, it stank. Are you traveling on business or perhaps for pleasure? I haven't decided. Surely it can't be your health in this tiresome climate. I hadn't noticed it until now. Oh, it's not too bad if you can afford a good modern hotel, Mr... I didn't catch your name. Well, it's Corbett. Quit Corbett. I've got exactly 180 piastres in my pocket, a birthmark on my left leg, and I'm on my way to Saigon to enlist in the Foreign Legion. Now, is there anything else you'd like to know about me? I beg your pardon. I was only trying to be social. If you please, sir. Now, what's on your mind? So you are going into the Legion. Then we shall be comrades. How do you say? Comrades. My name is Reicher. Karl Reicher. How are you? The other officers like that colonel in the German army also. <laughs> Perhaps that is why we lost the war. Now, who finally did win? I haven't seen a newspaper recently. This is a very strange thing to me. Why so many thousands of ex-soldiers, all of you bitter and disillusioned, should come to Indochina to fight for France? For me, it was a simple decision. The Legion cannot be worse than the Germany I left. The cold and hunger, the black despair, the terrible fear of Russia. No, I was only a simple private, Ein Dunkopf. But I would rather be a soldier again than a dead citizen of a dead country. And you, Mr. Corbett? Me? Oh, I've got a much better reason than that. I've never been home since the war ended. What's more, I never expect to go back. How odd. An American not to relish home. Of course, it has become quite a joke among us Saigonese about how many former German soldiers enlist in the Foreign Legion. We call it the Sixth Reich, when the French themselves call it Rogue's Regiment. I'm afraid they're not very happy about it. Why should they care who the Vietnamese kill if it isn't a Frenchman? They don't care particularly. It's the live ones who worry them the most. The Germans who might have had criminal war records, Gestapo agents and SS elite guards. Have they found any of those in the Legion? Quite a few. The SS men were betrayed immediately by the tattoo marks on their left arms. Uh -huh. What happened to them? They were sent back to Europe for trial and afterwards hung. These men were very unfortunate and not very smart. And you are? Smart enough to get into the Legion if I was an SS man. How would you accomplish it? There is a man in Saigon, A. Hazard, a very clever Arab, who can remove any tattoo mark without leaving a trace. Interested? Oh, no, sir. At this point, I left the compartment and walked down the corridor of the train. I didn't walk too far when I saw a French officer's cap at my feet. As I bent to pick it up, on eye level was the body of Colonel Le Mercier. He was dead.
You know, Riker, ever since you came onto the train, I've had a definite feeling we have met before. I don't think so. I could have sworn it somewhere in Europe years ago, but I cannot recall the time or place. Monsieur Corbett. Coming, Chief. You found the body, did you not, sir? Yes, sir. Uh, this melee Chris was beside the body of Colonel Le Mercier? That's right. Hmm. You saw no one who aroused your suspicion? Oh, sure I did. Dozens of them. Half the mob on that filthy train looked like cutthroats to me. If you please. Okay, Chief, sorry. How can I go? Uh, what is your address for the next three days? The Foreign Legion for the next five years. Oh? Uh, Monsieur Corbett, this is Colonel Mauclair, the commandant of the Legion. How do you do? Oh, excuse me, Colonel. I thought you were one of the police. There is no doubt why Le Mercier was murdered. Because he was close on the trail of whoever is smuggling guns into Indochina. But we will never know who did it. Eh, we never do. This open tool chest, who owns it? Uh, Reicher, the German. Reicher! Yes, sir? Why did you bring a tool chest along with you when there is no need for one in the Legion? I am a mechanic by trade. And with these tools, I have earned my passage from Europe, working wherever I could. I assure you, gentlemen, this man could not possibly have done the killing because he never left the compartment. Everyone in Saigon is your friend, my dear fellow. Reicher, Monsieur Van Ratten's word is good enough. Thank you, Herr Van Ratten. And you needn't worry about your tool chest. I'll store it for you in my home. I left the chief of police and the commandant of the Foreign Legion, Colonel Mauclair. But for the whole of the next day, a thought kept revolving in my mind. Van Ratten's voice repeating. There's a man in Saigon, a very clever Arab, who can remove any tattoo without leaving a trace. There's a man Without in leaving a trace. A it suddenly dawned on me. If the Arab had come in contact with members of the SS of Eat Guard, surely he could identify them. That way, I could narrow the list of suspects. So I visited a Hazarat at his tattoo shop. Uh, tattoo? Yes, removed. Can you do it? Uh, for a thousand piastres, it's possible. Any special rate for a small one? Uh, a thousand piastres. But it's only two letters. S.S. S.S.? Van Ratten sent me. Oh, he my good friend. Yes, yeah, so he told me. He also told me how many you've done for him. I bet you can remember every one of them. Ah, uh, Hazarat, no fool. A very discreet man. Never talk. Even for 50,000 piastres? Uh, 50,000? Yeah, cash. Uh, uh, Hazarat, remember. Uh, how far back can you remember? Uh, Hazarat, never forget. <laughs> A. Hazarat was the one man who could have possibly led me to Martin Bruner. But the bullet through the window stilled the Arab's mouth forever. Café La Petite Tranquilloise in Saigon was anything but petite. The dining room was dimly lit and smoke filled with a barn at the entrance where I stood. I found watching the noisy and belligerent German soldiers spread all over the room, dressed in French uniforms and singing of the fatherland, both an extraordinary and intriguing spectacle. At this point, a sergeant of the Legion, naturally a German, walked by and was stopped by O'Hara, an American. Hiya, Sarge! Hey, Stein, what's the hurry? I'm in no hurry, you are. Well, draw up a Stein, grab yourself some Sakura. Mm -hmm. Thank you, comrade. Want you to meet a couple of new comrades, and as of tomorrow, this is uh, Riker, countryman of yours. Riker? Sergeant Stein? And uh, this is Whit Corbett, an American from the States. Glad to know you, Sergeant. Well, let's drink up. That's what we're here for. This one's on me. Uh, well, yes, yes, but uh, you'll have to pardon me. <laughs> what's the matter with you, Stein? You drunk or sick or what? What do you mean, O'Hara? You're going to walk out on a free drink? Get out of my way, you stupid fool. 
Well, what's eating on that crowd? Could be a crowd. There was something vaguely familiar about Sergeant Stein. I'd seen his face before, but where? I didn't get too much time to think because a gorgeous doll, the French kind, the singer from the cafe, was coming directly towards me, and she was looking at me with more than casual friendliness. And I liked that kind of look. Drink, mademoiselle? Lady, monsieur. Hmm. Do you ever try singing in English? You've never been here before? No. What's your name? Lily. Lily Maubert. I will see you later, no? Yes. For a while. Just a tip, Corbett. Don't make a pass at the singer. It will only get you in a jam. Thanks, Cobb. Maybe that's the kind of jam I like. I met Lily late that night in her apartment. It was one of those lush, seductive, low-lit affairs. Pictures of German soldiers were all over the walls. But at the moment, I wasn't too interested in pictures. Then Lily entered, carrying two drinks, and sat down beside me on the divan. Do you know why you are here, monsieur? Well, I could guess, but I'd rather you tell me. You are here because it is essential that we meet. Oh, well, home was never like this. Drink up, sweet. Thank you. Now, sit a little closer, won't you? If you please, stay where you are. But you just said it was essential that we meet. Come on now, let's not play hide and seek. Monsieur Cobet, you are an agent of the American intelligence, are you not? Huh? I recognized you the moment I saw you in the cafe. Oh, hold on, sister. You've got me all wrong. Oh, no. Colonel Mauclair of the French Foreign Legion described you to me. Oh, well, well, all they told me in Frankfurt was to wait for a pickup by a French agent. But I wasn't expecting anybody like you. <laughs> Did you think I would wear a sign? <laughs> you don't need a sign. Mauclair said if there's anything you wanted to know tonight, ask me. Anything? Yes. Are you married? He meant about tomorrow, when you enlist. Oh, well, no, no, I've been fully briefed on that. It will not be easy for you in the Legion. I didn't think it would be. Or trying to find one German among thousands when none of us even knows what the guy looks like. Tell me, who do I clear my reports through, Mauclair or you? Either one of us, but I am working on something else at the moment. Oh? What's more important than finding Martin Bruner? There are things. Okay, okay, it's none of my business, skip it. Thank you, I will. Did uh, anyone ever tell you you're beautiful? Everyone, monsieur. Anything else? Okay. Do you have any instructions that we're not to uh, be seen together from now on? No, if you have something important to tell me. I'll find something. We could even talk shop. I'd like to learn how you French work. <laughs> I can imagine. You know, you're much too smart for a beautiful girl. Don't you have any fun at all? Perhaps. In a quiet way. I can be very quiet. Good. Here's your hat. Don't make any noise on your way out. Sorry. I just hadn't met anybody like you in a long time. Neither have I. You win. I'll be going. Oh, go into the other room. Sure. Lily? Mark Van Raton. I waited for you at the cafe, but they told me you left early with no message. So I became worried. Is there anything wrong? Uh, no, I uh, didn't feel well all evening, so I came home and went to bed. In those clothes? It was sweet of you to come by, but you'll excuse me for not asking you in. Of course, of course. I shall telephone you in the morning. If you feel better, perhaps we can have lunch together. Yes, do call me. Good night, Mark, and thank you again. Good night, my dear. Ah, nice fellow, isn't he? Very. I seem to have messed up your evening. You should have told me. I wasn't expecting anyone. Oh, sure, sure, sure. I used to have a friend that dropped in at 3 a.m. Gets to be a habit with some people. You know, I met Van Ratten on the train, and he asked too many questions. What does he do besides being an art dealer? That's my affair. Oh, yeah, that's all I gather. Good night. Thanks for the drink. Quel fou, il est stupid. The 
following day, I was inducted into the French Foreign Legion along with Riker and about 50 more recruits. I was put through my paces by Sergeant Stein, the face I was trying to place. Then I made contact with Colonel Mauclair and wound up spending every spare minute of my days and nights going through the dossier militaire files. Thousands of pictures. Major Corbett. Oh, Colonel Mauclair, I found what I've been looking for. Here, take a look at this photograph. Uh huh. Himmler, Hitler, Goering, S. And I do not know this one. Use this magnifying glass. Oh, impossible. This German lieutenant of the SS Elite Guard is Sergeant Stein. His correct name is Heindorf. You will note, sir, uh, look at the picture again. The officer with only the back of his head showing, that is Martin Brunner. And since we do not know what Brunner looks like, and we're sure Heindorf does... I will put him under arrest at Oh, once. no. No, that wouldn't help, Colonel. He wouldn't talk, even if he knew anything. Let me handle this my way. Hey, the mail's here. Come and get it. Here's one for you, O'Hara. Thanks a lot. Cobb. Thanks, Corbett. Who'd write me a letter? Dahlstrom. Engelbach. Schlitz. Stern. Hey, what do you think of this? A bill two years old from a butcher in Hackensack, New Jersey. For pig's knuckles. (laughs) Sergeant Stein. Letter for Sergeant Stein. A letter for me? That's what it says in the envelope. Sergeant Stein. Demi-brigade, La Citadel, Saigon. Why don't you open it, Sergeant? Letter from home, Sergeant Stein? No. uh, Yes. uh, No. The letter to Sergeant Stein, or Heindart, was postmarked Saigon and was sent to him by yours truly, Wood Corbett. Inside was the copy of the photograph I had shown Colonel McClare. I had circled the face of Heindorf with a thick pencil line and also the back of Brunner's head. In his bunk, Stein sat transfixed, staring at the marked photograph. Then he looked at the envelope and saw the postmark. Saigon. And he realized that whoever sent it was here. He looked up and our eyes met. And I knew at that moment I was a marked man, that I wasn't long for this world. But I counted on his fear. Fear that might lead me to my objective... Martin Brunner. But why would Heindorf be afraid of Brunner? They were close friends in Germany for years. Lily, Brunner didn't have any friends. He was a killer. Oh. The official executioner of Rim, Dolphus, Starnberg, Rommel. How many others we'll never know. They were all afraid of him. And that's what I'm still counting on. But you don't even know that Brunner is in Saigon. No, but if he is here, Heindorf will tell him about the picture. We watched Heindorf, and so far he hasn't left the Citadel or made a telephone call. That's why I think Brunner's in the Legion. What does Colonel Mauclair think? Oh, the same thing you do. That I'm fishing for whales with a bad pen. But he'll help me with a bait. Oh, I wish I could help you too. You're doing it now, dear. Just letting me look at you. It hit me the first time I saw you in the cafe. And later that night I knew it for sure. And then Mauclair told me about you. What you did during the war and what you're doing here. So I know you had courage, too. Mauclair told you of Van Rutten? Yes. That you're luring him into giving himself away as the gun runner who is aiding the Vietnamese in their war against France. Mm. I've been worrying about you, Lily. That's always the last stage. Oh, I've got it bad, Lily. Are you making love to me? I was trying to. Why? Does it amuse you? No, it doesn't. I think I like it. Very much. If you mean it. I mean it. Oh. Does that convince you? A little. Convince me again. Oh, that takes time. We haven't got much of it. We may have. Someday. I hope so. If Heindorf or Brunner doesn't get me first...
one solid week after Heindorf received the photograph, he was under constant surveillance. There was no doubt he was frightened, but since the camp was loaded with ex-German soldiers, it was impossible to record all of his conversations with the men. Then on December 6th, Legion Intelligence reported that Mark Van Ratten was in negotiation with Tron de Guion, the Indochina guerrilla leader, and was going to deliver a shipment of guns to him. Yes, Corbett. It is very fortunate for us that Lily has secured a map which tells where the guns will be delivered. Why don't you grab Van Ratten while he still has the guns? And for the same reason, you do not arrest Steindorf. If he can lead you to Martin Brunner, then Van Ratten can lead us to Tron de Guion. No, oh, he'd be too smart for that. Van Rat would never leave town. Yeah, he couldn't. We are watching him. But the guns will leave, and our troops will be there ahead of them. Come in. Colonel, sir, Sergeant Stein to see you. In the other room, Corbett. Very well, sir. Have Stein come in, Cobb. Yes, sir. The colonel will see you, Sergeant Stein. Thank you, Shane. Yeah, Colonel, sir. At ease, Sergeant. What is it you want? I, I wish to apply for transfer to another regiment, sir. Why? Because, well, frankly, sir, if I stay here, there will be trouble, and very soon. What do you mean, trouble? I have an enemy in the 13th Brigade, sir. A man who has twice threatened to kill me. What is his name? I, I cannot tell you that, sir. He's a good enough soldier, and I have nothing against him. It's an old hater he has for me from the last war. Are you certain that is all you wish to tell me? Yes, sir. But if you please, Colonel, this is an urgent request. Yes, I can see that. Please, I... I cannot promise it, Sergeant, but I will do what I can to arrange a transfer. Carry on. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Corbett. Major Corbett. Did you hear? That I did. Oh, this is it, sir. We've scared him out. That guy is terrified. Yes, but of whom? We still don't know that. No, but we're getting hot, Colonel. Red hot. Martin Brunner is here, in the Legion, in the Citadel. Not 50 yards from us at this moment. Two pertinent items noteworthy of special mention. Dossier military files, the very confidential ones, had been rifled. Someone had been checking to see what information they contained to discover whether my picture was private. Item number two, I received a note asking for a meeting that night at the Café La Petite Tonquinoise. It was unsigned. Naturally, I kept the appointment. It wasn't very long before I was joined in the booth by Sergeant Heindorf. Well, sit down, Sergeant. I was expecting you. Uh, yes, I wanted to talk to you. Why didn't you sign the note? What's the matter? Don't you know how to spell Heindorf, Sergeant Stein? That is why I wanted to talk to you. Well, before we begin our little chat, I'd like to tell you that I don't plan on being target for tonight. I don't understand. But from where I sit, I'm what you call a geranium. I can get potted from three sides. You're making a great mistake. I come here as a gentleman. Uh, which is the same as saying I come here to bury you. Now, pick up the salt shaker or something, whatever your prearranged signal is, and call off the bloodhound. I swear no one knows of this meeting. Okay, I'll let you in on another one. If I'm hurt, the commandant of the Legion gets the picture. And I'm sure you wouldn't want that to happen. Where did you get that picture? Well, I'm the best little file clerk in the business. You have such an ugly face, Heindorf, I recognized it immediately. And I also know who the man with his back to the camera is. Martin Brunner. Hmm? Surprised? How, how much will you take for that photograph? You don't have enough money. Just tell me how much. Now, let's put it this way. Your life. What, what do you mean? It is worth a plug nickel as long as Bruner's around. You're a threat to his life. You can identify him, and you're frightened. Plenty frightened. Oh, I'm not afraid of Bruner. Why should I be? I've, I haven't seen him in years. That's why you ask for a transfer out of Saigon. Don't hand me that. Go on, get him. I'll wait here for both of you. Nine! 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 Heindorf rose and lurched sideways. A bullet plunked into the seat he had vacated. The one with my name on it did likewise, for I had hit the floor and was crawling under a cigarette butt when it came. Bruner had tried for both of us, but he'd tried for Heindorf first, and Heindorf knew it. I decided to let him stew a little. The following morning, acting on Lily's information, the patrol of about a hundred of us, including Sergeant Heindorf, left to ambush and capture the guerrilla chief, Cran de Guion. For hours, I worked over Heindorf. What about, Heindorf? Did you go free? No. 
You've nothing to lose but your life. He's amongst us, isn't he? Ah, uh, leave me alone. Okay. Have it your own way. Who killed the Arab who removed the SS Elite tattoo marks? Was it Bruner? Did he remove yours? Who sent you, Van Ratten? How much do you have to pay him? Leave me alone, I said. Uh, you know, the Vietnamese will fight. And in a fight, someone usually gets killed. I'll bet three Croyd Gares against one Reichsmet it'll be you, Heindorf. Nein, nein, now leave me alone. Holy Missouri mule, that guy's ready to bust out crying. Uh, he will before long. Don't worry, Cobb. The ambush we'd planned on came off a schedule when we were on the wrong end. Somehow the guerrillas had gotten the guns and were busy showing us they knew how to use them. Want to make a bet on our chances, Corbett? No reasonable offer refused. Sure, but who'd collect it? Start working the walkie-talkie, O'Hara. Yeah. Cameron to the six. Cameron trying to come to the six. That fella could be a nuisance. Ammunition. Someone give me ammunition. You've got more than you can handle now, Sergeant. What are you so nervous about, them or Martin Bruner? We'll never get out of this. None of us. Your wife was out. Cameron to see. Corbett. I'll take over. Hammer on. Hammer on. Hammer on. Trying to contact. All clear here. All clear here. I'll trade places, Colonel. Where are you? We're at a point 57 north and 48 east. Again. We are on our way. I looked around for Heindor. He was zigzagging at top speed for the jungle. He almost made it. But at the edge of the underbrush, someone, probably Bruner, gave it to him in the back. I had at least 50 Germans about me from which to choose the marks. Not a very good one. For Heindorf was still fighting and kicking as the guerrillas swarmed over him and carried him away. Why don't we follow him, Corbett? Get him back. I'm all for it. Perhaps he deserted under fire, Corbett. So what, Ragger? Even if we could rescue him, which we cannot, he would be shot. Why are you in such a sweat about the sergeant, Corbett? He was no good anyway. Yeah, and he was a sergeant. It ain't every day you could lose one of them. This was one sergeant I didn't want to lose. Hours later, the troop was saved by the 6th Regiment. Bedraggled but not beaten, we returned to Saigon with a group of guerrilla prisoners. I never felt lower in my life. The loss of Heimdorf was a severe blow. I was back where I started from. Nowhere. Do you know what you are saying? Oh, sure. I'm certain of it, Lily. Martin Bruner was one of our patrol. That's why Heindorf ran out. He took the chance of being shot at or captured rather than face it out with Bruner, who he knew would kill him. And they took him prisoner? Yes which means we'll never lay eyes on him again or learn from him who Bruner is. Unless I... Unless uh, what? If I could only get him out somehow. We caught a bunch of Vietnamese in the fight, but McClare tells me they've never agreed to exchange prisoners. Oh, that's the call. The show will start soon. Oh, tell me you've missed me, darling. Oh, listen to my song tonight. So I will tell you what I think. Okay. But in the meantime, I'd like something on account. Oh... Your account is overdrawn, monsieur. Don't worry, dear. I'll make it good. All right, all right. Ah, so we meet again, Mr. Corbett. So we do. I'll be seeing you, Lily. Good night, Mr. Van Rotten. Lily, has this rude fellow upset you? To the contrary, he's quite charming. Oh? Are you a little jealous, Mark? Yes, intensely. That is why I've come to tell you something, Lily. We've got to leave Indochina as quickly as possible. The French believe they have defeated Tren de Guin, but they don't know him as I do. I have two tickets here to Singapore for tomorrow night. One is for you if you'll come with me. Well, must I give you an answer now, Mark? No, but by tomorrow at the latest. I still say this is a crazy plan, Corbett. You haven't one chance in a hundred to get back here alive, even if you reach Eindor. I know that, Colonel, but it's the only thing we've got left to try. Suppose you are taken prisoner in Trondigan's camp, and there's little doubt you will be if you proceed with this insane idea. How can you hope to escape? No other legionnaires ever have. Colonel McClare, I fully realize all the risks involved. But if it's only one chance in a million, I've got to take it. I've put in a lot of years searching for Bruner... Now, when I know he's practically within my grasp, I'll do anything to get him. Even give up your life, eh, Corbett? <laughs> well, 
Every man to his own way of being a hero. As for me... <laughs> well, I'm no hero, Colonel McClare. But I've got a job to do. And I've become very stubborn about writing Finney to Martin Bruner's questionable career. Uh, very well, Corbett. There's nothing left to do now but go to the jail and select the Vietnamese prisoner. Now, if we turn this prisoner loose, he's bound to head for Tran de camp. I'll follow. I'll wish you good luck now, Corbett. We've agreed on the rendezvous, and I'll send a motorized patrol to pick you up. If you can get away. Uh, wait here. Jailer, open the door. Yes, sir. Rouse the prisoners. Come on, come on, up on your feet, you guys. Up, 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 up. come on. That's it, get up. Now, quiet, quiet down. All right, quiet. I am Colonel Moclair, commandant of the Citadel. I have a message which I want taken back to your leader, Tron de Guillaume. You will select one man among you to carry my letter. That man will go free. But I wish the reply to be returned by one of my soldiers now being held prisoner in your camp. You have one minute to make your choice. Commandant, I have been selected. Very well, you may come out. Here's the letter. Tell Tron de Guillon I shall expect an answer in three days. Cobb, escort this man to the rear gate. Yes, sir. Through the dark, narrow streets and the alleys of the sleeping city of Saigon, I followed the released gorilla. Our paths were separated momentarily when I was interrupted by a drunken legionnaire who wanted to know where I was going and why he couldn't join me. It was Riker, the comrade from the train. I managed to brush him off and again picked up the trail. It led to a small Buddhist temple which I entered. It was dark with only a few candles burning. A life-size idol faced me from the altar. Cautiously, I moved forward and then stopped as the idol came to life and the melee Chris appeared in his hand. It was the gorilla I had been following. I got the idea and stood quietly as they tied my hands. Why did you follow me? I used to be a boy scout and I was trying to find two stones so I could light a fire. I'm not in a playful mood. Why did you follow me? But it could be I'm one of your sympathizers. Who knows? I might be a friend of Mark Van Ratten. That is not true. Well, that one I'll have to admit. I'd have to be a sucker to be a friend of Van Ratten. Why did you follow me? Your colonel's letter was a lie, a trap. It said nothing of value to him or me. If I'm not mistaken, wasn't the letter addressed to Tran de Guillon? Why don't you let him judge? I am Tran de Guillon. I have no recollection of the ensuing hours since I was battered into unconsciousness. When I came to, I was behind a barbed wire fence in the guerrilla camp. Immediately, I began searching for Heindorf. I found him in a crude bamboo hut, gravely wounded and feverish, with the look of a man who was dying. Corbett. Yes, Heindorf. Deutschland, you are. Including getting shot in the back? That wasn't in your contract. Sure, I wanted you to lead me to Martin Brunner, but he got you first. You knew that when he shot you in the back. Hmm? Which one of us was he? Why do you protect him, Heindorf? You're dying and he killed you in cold blood. If you don't tell me who he is, he'll never be found. He may be out of reach even now. Tell me, Heindorf. Is it Gerhardt? Hoffmiller? Is it Riker? It is Riker, isn't it? He is Martin Brunner. Yes, yes, yes. I buried Heindorf that afternoon, guarded by a lone Vietnamese guerrilla armed with a rifle. As I tapped the mound with my shovel, the guard mumbled for me to hurry. I hurried, all right. I flung a shovel full of dirt in his face and made a run for the nearby lagoon. I hit the water in a flat racing dive. 
And by the time he got the sand out of his eyes, I had crossed the lagoon and was safe in the jungle. I headed for Saigon and Martin Brunner. Meanwhile, Lily was with Colonel Mauclair. You said Van Raffen wanted you to leave with him on the plane tonight? Yes. Then go with him. You... you will let him go? Yes, yes. But only as far as the airport. We have found everything we have to know about Van Raffen. Who sent him the guns and how they were sent. He was paid a fortune for the job. And he would take it with him on the plane. We want to find the money on him. Call him. Tell him you will go. Very well. Yes? Mark, I I am leaving with you. Oh, this makes me very happy, my dear. I, I cannot tell you what it means to me. When hmm? shall I meet you and where? Our plane leaves at midnight, but I have some last-minute business. Be here at my house at 11. Could you take a taxi? Y yes, of course. Oh, goodbye, my dear. I love you very much. When I reached Saigon, I checked in with Colonel Mauclair and divulged Tran de Guion's identity. In turn, he told me about Lily's impending meeting at 11 o'clock with Van Ratten. Naturally, he was elated at discovering that Riker was Martin Brunner. I searched the barracks for the Nazi butcher, but he was nowhere around. So I checked into the cafe, La Petite Tonquinoise. Well, dust my britches if it ain't Corbett. Where you been? Snake hunting, Cobb. You look like the snake got you. <laughs> so have you seen anything of Riker here tonight? Riker? What do you want with him? He's my pal. Have you seen him? Yeah, about a half hour ago. He was having a drink with some guy. Who? Oh, the guy that's always making eyes at Lily, the rat or something. Oh? Huh? What time is it? Uh, almost 11. I'll see you later. Hey, where you going? To bite a snake. I arrived at Van Ratten's place, and as I walked up the stairs, I could hear voices from the open window. Oh, you can speak freely in front of Lily. She's of the French intelligence. Ma. Are you insane, Van Rutten? Oh, you needn't worry about Lily. You needn't worry that she'll ever repeat our conversation. Be seated here, Riker. Thank you. Now, shall we uh, settle our business? I have the $5,000 for you, but there's a small problem with your passport. We had no photograph of you, and that is one thing impossible to forge. I remember that. I took one from the Legion files. Excellent. These American bills were quite expensive. Together with this passport, you owe me $20,000. You have it with you, of course. No, I didn't have to bring it. It was already here. Where is the tool chest you've been storing for me? There, by the divan. The tools in that chest are all made of platinum. Why and where they come from needn't concern you. But altogether, they are worth a quarter of a million dollars. Or perhaps more. If you doubt it, test them. It isn't necessary. You see, I have already tested them. You have done what? I borrowed the chisel from the chest to open something, and it broke in half. So naturally, I became curious. They were not meant to be used. But since you know their value, you can take what I owe you. And what would you consider a fair price You for? said 20000 You didn't let me finish, Bruna. Bruno. This is a day for surprises, my dear. Then add this to your collection. I fear I was careless. My pistol is... is... in that drawer. Close it. Now, uh, where were we? You were about to ask for a fair price. I give you the answer. Mark! And now, Fräulein, it is your turn. There was nothing for me to do at that moment but break in. Then the realization came to me that I was unarmed. But there's an old saying, fools rush in where angels fear to tread. Corbett, welcome. Up with your hands. Sure, Martin Brunner. Brunner? Yes, the butcher of Dakar. Hmm. Shall I add you two to my list, comrade? Yes, yes, I shall. Turn around, Corbett. Oh, please. Do as I say. Have you ever enjoyed the spectacle of watching a man die, Fräulein? Don't answer him, Lily. 
Come on, get it over with, Brunner. There's no hurry. We Nazis have plenty of time. We have patience. There will be another Fuhrer. Today we are defeated, but tomorrow the world. Tell me, Herr Corbett, have you confided my identity to anyone? You think I'd be sucker enough to keep such good news to myself? You're as good as hung right now. How do you figure to get out of Saigon? Everyone knows your face. I already have considered a plan. You will save my life. I will? Yes. That is why you are still alive. You will escort me to the plane which will carry me to safety. And supposing I refuse? You won't. I promise you your freedom. You mean you expect me to believe you? You have no other alternative. Oh, yes. Herr von Rotten had two plane tickets. I shall take Lily with me as a hostage to be sure that my trip is not interrupted. You understand? On the nose. Now... We leave. Aren't you forgetting something? I do not think so. After all the work and trouble you went to, aren't you going to take these tools? The tools, yes. Yes, of course. This is another sample of Nazi superiority. I carried this fortune under the very noses of the stupid French and American agents. Oh, so you did. And the least I can do is to help you get started on your journey. Here, cash. Let's use a little of this on that wrist. That's better. Now we're both unarmed. My instructions are to bring you back alive. That's what I'm going to do. Just barely. Go! In the gray dawn at Nuremberg, the last chapter for the Nazi war criminals was a job for the hangman. And the last steps of Martin Brunner on that scaffold are a warning to the world that such men must not march again. There is no other road to justice in mankind's dream for a lasting peace. End of report. Our thanks to Dick Powell, Peggy Dow, and Alex Nicole for an excellent performance. Our stars will return in just a moment with screen director Robert Florey. Next week, our story will be one which has been enjoyed in novel and picture by millions of Americans. Back Street, with Charles Boyer, starring in his original role. In future weeks, it will be the pleasure of screen director's playhouse to bring you other outstanding adaptations, such as Beyond Glory, starring Alan Ladd, The Gunfighter, starring Gregory Peck, and DOA, starring Edmund O'Brien. Now, here again are tonight's stars, Dick Powell and Peggy Dow. Ladies and gentlemen, the making of a movie involves hundreds of technicians and artists in numerous capacities. And the boss man, the guiding genius of all these talents, is the director of the piece. Under his sure hand, the motion picture is gradually brought to life. I'm very proud to present the director of Rogue's Regiment, my good friend, Robert Florey. Thank you, Dick. It was a fine experience directing Rogue's Regiment, and I really enjoy listening to you this evening. And Peggy, Peggy Dar, it was a pleasure to hear you, too. I saw you in Harvey, and you were wonderful. Thank you very much, Mr. Florey. You're very kind. Oh, Dick, I've been listening to your own radio show, Richard Diamond. It's excellent. I hope that with all your activities, you will have time to come back to our screen director's players again and soon. We always present the best, and you are. This goes for you too, Peggy. Please do invite me back again soon. Good night. Ditto for me, Bob. Good night, all. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. Rogue's Regiment was presented through the courtesy of Universal International Pictures, now releasing Hollywood Story, co-starring Richard Conti and Julia Adams. Dick Powell can currently be seen in the RKO production, Cry Danger. Peggy Dow appeared through the courtesy of Universal International Pictures, 
who will soon release The Prince Who Was a Thief. A Technicolor production co-starring Tony Curtis and Piper Laurie. Alex Nicole appeared through the courtesy of Universal International Pictures, who will soon release Smuggler's Island. A Technicolor production co-starring Jeff Chandler and Evelyn Keyes. Included in tonight's cast were Ned Lefevre as the general, Stan Waxman as Colonel Moclair, Paul Dubov as Cobb, Rye Billsbury as Carl Riker, Don Diamond as Tron de Guion, Ken Harvey as O'Hara, and Henry Rowland as Heindorf. Rogue's Regiment was adapted for radio by Jack Rubin. Screen Director's Playhouse is produced by Howard Wiley and directed by Bill Karn. Portions of tonight's broadcast were transcribed. This is Jimmy Wallington speaking and inviting you to listen next week when Screen Director's Playhouse presents Back Street, starring Charles Boyer with Screen Director Robert Stevenson. <laughs> Well, I hope you enjoyed that presentation. I did have to do some editing to make it fit into our one-hour format. Basically, I removed all the station breaks and commercials. But I did try to make the experience a good one. The actual events of Klaus Barbie, the real guy from our story, were quite different from those depicted. However, he was on the run and hid in Italy, but got away again. Barbie was identified as being in Peru by Nazi hunters from France who came across a secret document and photos that revealed his alias. He was not actually tried for his crimes until 1983, and even then he managed to escape the death penalty and was sentenced to life in prison. However, many believe that the Butcher of Leon probably should have had worse. He died from complications with cancer while in prison. Did you know that Ron's Amazing Stories is sponsored by Audible? Audible is home to over 180,000 audiobooks, any of which can be yours. All you have to do is sign up for a 30-day free trial and Audible will give you a free book and access to their original content. To download your free audiobook, go to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Thank you, Audible. That was episode number 597, another full show dedicated to one single story. Now, I want to ask for your feedback on these type of shows. Do you like them? Let me know. It'll help me a lot. If you want to follow the podcast or the blog, head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you will find any of the links I mentioned and how to contact us. Do you want to help the show? The best thing you can do is to tell your friends all about it and please leave reviews or feedback wherever you listen. Clicking that follow or like button helps us grow. Thank you for listening and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. All of the vintage audio used in the podcast is believed to be in the public domain. Ron's Amazing Stories does not own the rights to any of the old-time radio used here. If you hold the rights to any of the shows played, please contact us immediately at ronsamazingstories.com.